Engines are everywhere. The engines are very important. Engines move us around, they cut our grass, they blow our snow, and engines are very complicated. Engines also make a mess. Uh, they are obviously a source of air pollution. Cleaning up engines, making them more efficient, is uh, something that a lot of engineers work very hard to do. In fact, the word engineering came from engines, so obviously back in the day, uh, what we did was uh, basically all about engines. And uh, an engine, at least a traditional internal combustion engine, is made up of a bunch of pistons that go up and down inside cylinders. And maybe you've seen this uh, dramatically depicted in oil commercials. Uh, anyway, an engine consists of a number of what are called slider crank mechanisms that are arranged in sometimes four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder arrangements. Uh, let's take a look at a single cylinder engine animation that I got from YouTube from someone named E-I-G-U-D-E. -E. Anyway, here's an animation of an engine, computer simulation. We can see the piston going up and down. Up at the top, a spark plug will ignite some compressed gas. It'll blow the piston down. We'll get rotary motion coming out. Uh, another interesting aspect of engine design and analysis, besides the pollution and the efficiency and the power aspects of it, is engine shaking forces. Engine shaking forces are uh, something that the uh, engine designers try to minimize. If you take a snowblower engine and put it on a table and start it up, it's going to hop all over the table. You've got to bolt these things down. Uh, because if we go back and look at our engine animation from before, the piston has mass. When the piston goes up and slows down, it tends to pull up on the entire engine block. When the piston goes down and is slowed down, it tends to push down on the, uh, the engine block. So typically in a snowblower or lawnmower engine, once per rotation of the crankshaft, you're going to get a shaking force peak up and a shaking force peak down. And the exercise that we're going to do is going to get at uh, some of the details of how you might calculate the engine shaking forces and also some interesting and not obvious aspects of engine shaking forces. I mentioned before this thing called a slider crank. Here's an animation of a very generic, not particularly awe-inspiring slider crank, but it just shows you the, the, the different bits. It also shows you how you might assemble one of these things in the real world so that the parts didn't interfere with each other. I'm just going to pause this somewhere. It's called a slider crank mechanism. Obviously there's a slider, which in an engine is a piston, which slides back and forth in what's called reciprocating motion. There's a connecting rod, which joins the piston to a link which usually rotates continuously through 360 degrees. And this short link is called the, uh, the crank. So we have a crank, connecting rod, and a slider. Now in your mechanisms course, for those of you who do mechanical, you will learn how to plot the uh, motion of the slider for various engine speeds and you'll learn that the engine shaking forces are proportional to the acceleration of the mass of the piston. Now, as we watch this thing in motion, if the crank moves at a constant speed, um, the horizontal distance of the end of the crank from the uh, this fixed point here kind of varies sinusoidally. It looks like the piston motion is a cosine or a sine, so we would expect the shaking forces to be a cosine or a sine as well. But just to backtrack a bit, there's other uses for a slider crank. For example, you can uh, turn continuous rotating motion of the crank link Obviously, you can turn that into back-and-forth motion of the slider. And if you were to turn this slider into a toothed rack and then join that onto a gear, 
and then pin that gear down somewhere, what would happen is, is as the crank rotated continuously, this rack would move back and forth with the slider, and we would get reciprocating or back and forth motion of this round gear. So that's one way you can make washing machine agitators work. You have a motor that spins continuously and the agitator goes slosh, slosh, slosh back and forth and cleans your clothes. Uh, so I found another little internet animation of that from Leighton Thomas. So I'll just play this. There you can see a homemade slider crank. As it moves back and forth it engages with that yellow wheel and it gives the wheel a a back and forth motion like a washing machine agitator. Okay, uh, slider cranks can be made into all sorts of useful devices. Uh, we've so far just looked at the crank and the connecting rod and the slider. Suppose you were to weld a piece onto the mechanism somewhere. Like here imagine we weld a, a bar onto the connecting rod and let's look at the different possible paths that can be traced out by different points on this attachment as the crank rotates continuously. If we weld a bar on there and we put a pen through this point and trace out the path of this point on a piece of paper, it's going to look like this flattened shape. The path of this purple point at the tip here is going to go through kind of an ellipse, but there's a large area of basically straight line motion that we can get. So it's often of interest to mechanism designers to try and generate straight line motion with a continuously rotating mechanism or to move something like a hook or a, um, a workpiece for a, a machine tool through a certain path. Maybe in a, a, a laundromat you need to hook a hanger, slide it along a rack, pick up another one, slide it along the rack and so on. So. Uh, taking the basic slider crank and by putting these by extending some of the links you can get very useful types of motion okay so my final uh, point that I want to make about this is here's an inline six-cylinder engine that I got off the uh, web from motorcycles uh, dot com actually motorcycleusa.com it's an inline six-cylinder engine as used in many BMWs, an extremely smooth engine. And what happens in this engine is there's six pistons flailing about, and when two of them are going up and creating upward shaking forces, two of them are going down, and the other two are probably somewhere in the middle. So there's a complete balance of the shaking forces uh, in this engine. And that's why it's very smooth, and and not just BMW six-cylinder engines, but any inline six-cylinder engine, if you put it together the right way, is going to be very well balanced. Um, this picture is of a Honda four-cylinder engine. It's an inline four-cylinder engine. And in this engine, we can see that the way it's put together, when two of the pistons go up, two of them will be coming down and vice versa. So you would think that this engine would also be inherently balanced and would have very low up and down shaking forces due to the masses of these pistons being sped up and slowed down in the vertical direction. However, the inline four is not inherently smooth and balanced like the inline six. Uh, expensive four-cylinder engines, like in the Honda, they're going to have a set of balance shafts, two shafts spinning in opposite directions joined by these gears that rotate in different directions. These are called counter-rotating balance shafts. And these actually spin at twice the engine speed. So once per rotation of the engine, the upward piston motion is cancelled by downward piston motion. But there's something interesting that happens at twice the speed of the engine. So if you were going to measure the shaking forces in the engines turning at 3000 RPM, you wouldn't see any shaking forces that occur 3,000 times a minute. You would see shaking forces that occur at twice that, or 6,000 times a minute. And those shaking forces are usually not very big, but they're big enough that in a lower-end car's four-cylinder engine, the engine is going to sound coarse and rough and not pleasant to rev really high, whereas a balance-shafted engine like this one will be uh, very smooth throughout the whole rev range.
We're going to talk about this. We're going to use this example to introduce you to Microsoft Excel to plot things that are related to shaking forces and also a very powerful software program called MATLAB which will allow you to write very short and simple programs to calculate and uh, plot things like these shaking forces.